Well, praise God. Welcome. It's good to be with you today. We've had a great service so far. Have you sensed the Holy Spirit moving? Amen. In powerful ways. In the prayer, in the communion. And we just want to continue with the word. The word today is about the power of thanksgiving. And, you know, of course, what we've been doing this morning is recognizing our thanksgiving to Jesus for what he did, what he gave us in his own, his own body and his own blood. So let's just uh, believe God to do something special in the word today concerning the power of thanksgiving. You know, thanksgiving, we understand, too, is, you know, the, the politeness, the niceties of please and thank you. And we need to do that. But there's something for the church for every believer in understanding how much power there is in living thanks, in thanksgiving towards your God, towards one another, but I'm speaking especially towards our God. You know, everything in, in life is in some way connected relationally. You know, even in the creation, you look at the creation and you look at the, the you know, out at the universe, you look at the earth and you look at the sun, and you see these things have a connection uh, together, that is the design of God, that they have a relationship. The earth has a relationship with the sun. Every 24 hours, the sun or the earth completes a rotation, and you have day and night. Every year, it completes a revolution in orbit around the sun, and you have the seasons. And so even on the earth, you know, between the oceans and the water and the atmosphere, we have a climate, and, you know, there's problems with it in terms of what's What's occurring with it? You see more uh, disasters. You see flooding. You see, uh, you know, even a minor temperature increase uh, increases the, the melt and increases the water level. So all these things work together. And even if they're out slightly, just a small amount of difference can create a great catastrophe. That's how much God, hallelujah, has designed things to keep in relationship. And the same is with us. God wants us in relationship one with another and with him. And he wants us to live in that and know the power in that relationship that we have. So I, I believe one of the strongest, most powerful spiritual forces that we have to work in our lives and with one another in God is thanksgiving, being a thankful people. Hallelujah. So, well, you know, I want to believe today for us to understand and possess and exercise in a greater way the power of thanksgiving in our lives you know we're living as we noted today we're living in the end times and um, we see the manifestations that the bible speaks about um, particularly paul in second timothy 3 spoke this about uh, the end times you can put this scripture up if you have it yeah but know this that in the last days perilous times will come for men will be lovers of themselves Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders without uh, self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, that's religiosity, but denying its power, denying the power of God. And from such, the, the apostle tells us, turn away. So he's describing the evil time, and he's saying for us to be careful not to get uh, close into the world and find ourselves polluted by these things, But because uh, this is where uh, sin flows from. You know, the first thing Paul mentions in this uh, time is that men will be lovers of themselves. That's kind of like proud, egocentric, self-serving, self-centered, uh, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. You know, so that's just a formula for destroying relationships, and that's what it does. When we're unthankful in a relationship, when we, when we don't recognize the value in the relationship we have, if it's, a, if it's a spouse, if we don't value that spouse and, and give thanks for that spouse, that partner, then we devalue the relationship. And if I'm unthankful with what I have, uh, then I devalue what I have, what I possess. If I don't value my relationship and deepening my relationship with Christ, I devalue it. See, I should be growing. We should be growing in the value we place in the relationship we have with Christ. We become saved, but there's, there's greater things to come into our lives in possessing uh, the, the, the promises of God. You know, I got a, a story to tell you here that was a well-known story. 
some of you may know the story, but the story came through uh, Russell Conwell, and he was the founder of Temple University. And he published a story that he, wasn't his story, he heard the story on his travels through the Middle East. This story was told to him. But he used the story in his sermons and in, not, in his uh, lectures. He included often this story uh, to bring out the point about uh, not devaluing what you have and, and, and giving thanks for what you have. And so this story concerned a man who owned a small acreage, a small farm in South Africa. And he worked that farm for many years, but could barely even get even meager crops out of it. It was not very productive. And he increasingly became discouraged with it, began to curse it. Uh, the soil was full of rocks. Uh, so he began, began to be really develop an attitude towards it which was, was he cursed it. And uh, in that unthankfulness for what he had, uh, he began to uh, get more and more discouraged. And, you know, that unthankfulness kind of sets up conditions that bring hardness of heart, that bring bitterness, that bring anger out. So this man became fed up with this farm, uh, and he heard that there was gold on the coast of South Africa. So he sold the property for what he could uh, to go and, and look for uh, a stake in the gold. Uh, disgusted with the farm, he sold it for a mere $28. Now, this is some time ago. $28 would have been worth more, but uh, the fact is it was much less value than you would normally get for that much land. So he struck out to find gold, but he died shortly after, more miserable and poor than he had been on the farm, never finding the gold. But sometime later, after his death, the new owner, there was a new owner of the land, and he began digging in the rocky soil to see what kind of minerals might be there. I don't know, maybe he got a revelation, he got an idea. Somehow it came to him that there might be more uh, in those rocks uh, than just interfering with crops being grown. But he found in there the largest diamond mine that, that was ever found in the world. It was valued in multiplied billions. And so he's, you know... This was sold unknown of its value. But it speaks of us that sometimes what we have, we haven't reached in to find the depths or the other things God has for us. You know, we possess, I believe in the promises of God that are given in the word of God, that we possess a lot more than we know we possess. And if we'll dig a little deeper, hallelujah, with the guidance of the Holy Spirit into the word of God, we'll find we have more than we dreamed we had. So just that story to share with you. Because of his unthankfulness, he was robbed of a great blessing. So the, man, the, the, the value of maintaining a thankful heart cannot be overemphasized, no matter how difficult. And sometimes things get really difficult to maintain thankfulness, even to our God, because things aren't working out. Uh, things didn't come to pass as you'd hoped they'd come to pass. Or something failed that you tried. And so you can get discouraged. Over time, you get discouraged. You know, it, it causes your heart to become isolated. And some way that you hope to get out of that and get the victory. Uh, but sometimes it takes a long time. And sometimes we lose hope. And sometimes we, we, we end up cursing and uh, bringing hardness to our heart. You know, one of the great stories of the Bible that tells of uh, Thanksgiving and the operation of the power of thanksgiving is Jonah's story. You know, Jonah was the prophet that had an assignment from God to go to Nineveh and preach the gospel because God wanted the, this city that was an enemy city of Israel. It was in the, uh, the Assyrians that ran that, and Assyria had invaded Israel repeatedly and finally overran Israel and took the people captive. Yeah, so Jonah um, ran from that assignment. Of course, you kind of know the story. It's the story of God created a fish to, uh, when he was tossed in the sea, to swallow Jonah. And it says of Jonah uh, that, you know, his soul, um, he may have even died and been resurrected. It's, you know, the, the story of Jonah is he's in this whale, and he was in there three days and three nights. And Jesus said in Matthew 12 and 40, he gave a comparison. He said, for as Jonah was three days, uh, 
and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days, three nights in the heart of the earth. So there's a comparison there about how long at least he was in there, that fish, for three days and three nights. Now, I think if you can kind of imagine what that would be like to be in the belly of a fish, first of all, it's, you know, it's slimy, uh, it's suffocating, obviously. Um, uh, he's, it's dark. Uh, so it's really a, 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 like a torture chamber in there for um, Jonah. But the, the beautiful thing about Jonah, he says this, he lifted up prayers from the belly of the fish. And it says, it says this in Jonah uh, 2 and one, 1 and 2. It says, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly. And he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction. And he answered me out of the belly of Sheol. And I cried and you heard my voice. You heard my voice. You know, when you pray, God will hear your voice. He will hear you when you pray, when you cry out to him. It says in verse 9, it says, when my soul fainted within me. Whether that means he died or whether that means he just was beginning to die. It sounds like he was beginning to be in the last moments of his life. He said, it fainted within me. He said, I remembered the Lord and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. So this is his, declarating, his declaration prayer. Then he says in verse 9, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. So he sacrificed. See, thanksgiving in that kind of situation is a sacrifice. You're not feeling like thank, being thankful. What do you have to be thankful for? You're on the verge of death. You can't get out. But he says, I will sacrifice to you. That is, regardless of the way I feel or the desperate situation I am, I'm going to make a sacrifice and give thanksgiving to my God. Praise God. So he said, I, and then he says, I will pray what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. So jo Jonah's testimony is one of a, a, the victory of the sacrifice of the prayer of thanksgiving. Hallelujah. Jonah declares, even at the moment of his death, as his soul fainted within him, Jonah made a threefold commitment back to God. Because what he had done, of course, is run from the assignment of God. So I got three notes here. I got three points here on the note that says this. First of all, he says, I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I'll lift up thanksgivings. That means he will praise God. He'll lift up thanksgivings. He'll recognize his God. He will declare who he is. He'll declare his love for him. That's the sacrifice that's in the voice of thanksgiving. Then he said, I'll pay my vows. What he's doing here is repenting. He says, I remember my assignment, and I was disobedient. I ran but my vow, I'll pay my vow, I'll go to Nineveh, you know. So he's pleading that he's, he's repenting, saying, I want to fulfill my vow as a prophet that had an assignment to go to a people and preach to them whether I didn't want to do that. Jonah likely didn't want to do that because he hated the Assyrians. And so it would be like telling a Ukrainian pastor to go preach to Russia now. You know, people that had been uh, persecuted and had been tormented by the Assyrian army. Uh, so he said, I'll, 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 do, I'll pay my vows. Uh, and he declares, because salvation is of the Lord. That is, salvation is where you want salvation to take place, not where I want it to take place, right? He said the assignment was to take salvation, the message of the gospel of salvation to, the, to Nineveh, to the Assyrians, that they might be saved. Uh, you know, so Jonah had uh, not wanted to do that. Uh, for emotional reasons, for those things in his life that uh, maybe his family had been uh, tormented or even killed by the Assyrians in one of their invasions. But, you know, salvation is, Lord, you got to set your stuff aside, put it on the sacrifice, put it on the altar, let God take that sacrifice and let him move your life to where he wants to take it. Praise God. As soon as Jonah made that threefold commitment, uh, Firstly, initiating the thanksgiving. Then, you know, repenting and, uh, to, and following the instructions, being willing to follow the instructions of God to do the mission. Um, and finally, to um, recognize that where God assigns you is where God assigns you. And to do the, to do the thing God assigns you to do, there will be a blessing in it for you. So he said, I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. This is... Based in Old Testament times, the sacrifice 
in the times of what Joey made reference to of animal sacrifices, um, the, there was a certain way you had to offer the sacrifice with thanksgiving. So, you know, the, the Old Testament presents pictures of the way, you know, of the way they did those things that are reflected in the way we do things now. That is, they were things done in the natural, but for us now in Christ Jesus, they are, they are kind of, uh, uh, there's a parallel in the spirit realm to the way the sacrifice of thanksgiving works for us. I want to point that out to you about sacrifice. The second note here, every sacrifice in the Old Testament had to be placed on the altar. So you couldn't just lay it on the ground and say, here's my sacrifice. You had to have an altar. And that altar had to be of the design of God. So all the instructions for the tabernacle and the sacrifice system were very specific. And Moses was told by the Lord, make sure that you do this according to the way I've given you the instructions to do things, you know, to, to the very T, to, to everything precisely as you've been told to do it on the mountain. So the altar was built you know, for the, you know, the tabernacle with, of Moses with specific instructions. And likewise, uh, the offering, you know, the offering had to be without blemish. You know, it had to be a perfect, the animals were examined, that they could properly make the, spe made the, made the specifications uh, for the, the correct act, uh, sacrifice. Um, just as, you know, Jesus was the perfect, perfect man. He had to be perfect. He couldn't have any sin in order to be an acceptable substitute for us. And so that was the image in the animals. They were inspected. The priest checked them all over. And so uh, on the altar that we have, our altar is no longer like that, but our altar was the cross of Christ. That's where the sacrifice for us took place. It took place at Calvary. And so, you know, we worship, you know, as they worshiped at these altars, to God and lifted up uh, praises at the his altars of sacrifice. We, we, as we did this morning, we worship at the altar of the cross of Christ. You know, uh, Hebrews 13.10 says this. It says, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. So he's making a reference here to Hebrew Christians who were still kind of mixing the law and Christianity, the grace of God. Still some of them were doing uh, the, the law, even some apparently the sacrifices. But he said, if you're still in that, you can't be in this, you know, because that's all been eliminated now through the sacrifice of Christ. And so in the next note, the, all sacrifices, all sacrifices, the next note, if you put it up, all sacrifices had incense placed on them. They all had incense placed on them. That is a perfume incense that when it was burned, uh, set on fire, it would give an aroma. And, you know, Jesus, so the animal sacrifices had this incense uh, placed on them when they were tied on the altar. And Jesus, prior to him going to the cross, he was anointed at Bethany with the perfume by Mary, if you recall that. Uh, he, that anointing, it was only shortly before uh, the, the, his arrest that he was in Bethany. And that anointing was placed on him with that worship from Mary. And he said of that that you, he had been anointed onto his death. So he had this, when he went to the cross, there was still that fragrance on him from that, that incense that was laid on him. All the sacrifices had incense placed on him. And that aroma is the incense of worship. What does it represent? It in, represents the incense of worship. You know, that incense had no aroma until it was set on fire. And it's like us. We can't truly worship people unless we're set on fire, unless we have passion for the love of God, the love of Christ inside us, that aroma that God's looking for in our worship, that deep worship. Uh, that's what God's looking for. You know what it says in the Word of God? Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise, into the holy of holies. That's the place of worship. That's how we go in. But thanksgiving is our entrance way. Thanksgiving people is our entrance way. So that allowed this setting up of power of worship and thanksgiving to be released in the move of the Holy Spirit. If you determine to be thankful to God, it will create a place and time for the Holy Spirit to consume, hallelujah, with spirit fire, your sacrifice of thanksgiving, praise, and worship. 
Hallelujah. My next note is that any sacrifice laid on the altar, any sacrifice laid on the altar was consumed with a kind of fire that was not kindled in the earth by man. Yeah, they couldn't just start the sacrifice on fire with fire that you just would start anywhere. All the fire on the sacrifices uh, from the temple, the tabernacle of Moses, and those from the, uh, the, sac from the temple of Solomon, they were all given with fire that came down from heaven. Let me read you that. This is on the dedication of the, the tabernacle of Moses. It says this in Leviticus 9, 20, 22 through 24. It says, Then Aaron lifted his hand towards the people, blessed them, and came down from offering the sin offering, the burnt offerings, and the peace of meeting, and came out to bless the people. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people, and fire came out before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. When all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. And then at the dedication of Solomon's temple, the similar event occurred. It says this in 2 Chronicles 7, 1 through 2. It says, when Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offerings and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the temple. That is that they, they, they probably collapsed. See, the priests were commanded in the, in the sacrifice system not to let that fire ever go out. So of Moses' system and, and the tabernacle of Solomon, that fire that came down had to be kept. You couldn't let that fire go out. You had to use that same fire for every sacrifice that you did every day, every week, every year, decades, centuries. So the same fire that came down at their dedication is the same fire that they used for every, every uh, sacrifice. They kept it. They had to keep that fire through keeping wood on it. Keep that fire going. Don't let that fire go. They were commanded, don't let that fire go out. As that fire came down from heaven. And so they preserved that fire, used it in the sacrifice, and they were commanded to do that. And so it is, you know, we have a fire from God. You know, that initial dedication of those temples for the Old Testament is a reflection of what took place at Pentecost. See, our, our, our place where we received the Holy Spirit was on that first Pentecost uh, that occurred 50 days after Jesus' resurrection, and the 120 were gathered in the upper room. And then in, uh, after a 10-day prayer, they were and waiting on the Lord, the fire fell. The Holy Spirit came. Fire was seen on their heads, and they began to speak in tongues, and they were filled with the Spirit. And that same fire that came down at Pentecost is the same fire that's in you now. That same fire is in us now. That's been passed down through the church in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When we're baptized with the Holy Spirit, we have the same event and the same Holy Spirit that came down on them is comes down on us. So we're connected to the original event through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The same event repeats and the same Holy Spirit with the same manifestations, with the same power, comes to us. So that's why we speak in tongues. That's why we lay hands on the sick and, they get, and they, they get healed. That's why we declare the gospel. He said, don't go witnessing without this Holy Spirit. Don't go and do the work of God, the ministry of God, without the experience of the Holy Spirit in your life. So, you know, it's important, you know, because and to exercise it, to keep, you know, to keep the fire burning. The priest had to use natural things like the wood to keep the fire burning. But we have something to keep the fire burning. And the thing we have to keep the fire burning, the wood, hallelujah, is our worship. The wood is our thanksgiving. The wood that we put on the Holy Spirit in us to keep the, to, to keep the, the fire burning within us is worshiping our God. It's entering his gates with thanksgiving. Going into his courts with praise and going into the holy place, going into the presence of God. Hallelujah. In this temple, in the temple he's put in you, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. God dwells in you. Hallelujah. You are in the earth a place 
a holy place. It says he designed, it says in Ephesians, I think, 4 and 22, 24, it says, hallelujah, he's created you, hallelujah, in the image of Christ. He's created you in true righteousness and holiness. In true righteousness and holiness, he's created your new spirit in you. Place that in a tabernacle in your body, and you're carrying the presence of God within you in the Holy Spirit. And you are joined unto Christ and one spirit with him. Hallelujah. That's who you are. I talked last week about who are you. That's who you are. That's your true identity. Your true identity as a child of God is that your spirit now is fully engaged with Christ, connected to all his benefits and promises, all those things, and you're empowered with that baptism in the Holy Spirit to do the things of God. So praise God. God's holy presence is in us. We are a sanctuary. When we come together in this sanctuary, all our sanctuaries together bring us into a fellowship because we have the same spirit of Christ. Can you say amen? So we approach, approach God on the basis of grace through faith, uh, being confident that he has, that we as, he has invited us to come boldly, not in anxiety or fear, but with our prayers, with supplication, and uh, with prayers on behalf of others, with thanksgiving, it says in Philippians 4 and 6, it says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Praise God. You know, Psalm 104 says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise and be thankful to him and bless his name. Psalm 95, 2 tells us the same thing. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with praise. So thanksgiving creates, I believe, this strong bond, personally for each of us with God and personally in the church with one another. Thanksgiving creates this powerful bond. You know, at the Last Supper, at the communion that Jesus uh, presented his uh, to his disciples that first communion, that first Passover. Uh, it says he lifted up the bread and he gave thanks. And likewise, he held the juice and he gave thanks. It says in Matthew 26, 26, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, take this, eat this, this is my body. And it says, um, then he took the cup, gave thanks and offered it, and then uh, off, gave thanks and offered it and said, drink, drink it, all of it. This is the blood of my, uh, the covenant, which is poured out for you. So Jesus gave thanks, but he's not just giving thanks here for um, the juice, uh, the wine, and the bread. He's giving thanks for his body and his blood, that he's thankful that he has been able to come and give his body and give his blood for the people. He's thanking God for the opportunity that he was given to take up flesh, to become a human, and to lay down that life. He was thankful in advance of just a few hours away, a great agony and suffering. And yet he was thankful for where he was going because he knew what it would do. He knew it would redeem the human race, whoever wanted to embrace it. Whoever wanted to receive it could receive the fullness of what he was going to do. But he was thankful to his father. You know, he gave thanks even when he was at the, when he was at the, I just thought of it, when he was at the tomb of Lazarus. And he, uh, it says he wept there. But then as he uh, got ready to pray before he called forth Lazarus to come out of the tomb, uh, it says he lifted up his hands to heaven and he said, God, he gave thanks to God. He said, I thank you, God, that you hear me. He says, I thank you, God, that you hear me. And then he gave declaration for Lazarus to come forth. So Jesus knew the power of thanksgiving. We have to know the power in thanksgiving in our lives. It changes things. You know, he took that bread, he broke it. And likewise, he did the same with the juice in thanksgiving to God. You know, just in conclusion, um, when they left, after the Last Supper, and they went out into the night, and they went to the Garden of Gethsemane. On the route there, they sang a song that was traditional 
at the Passover. And it's believed to be Psalm 118. And uh, Psalm 18 has a number of references that are prophetic to uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus. But the first verse and the last verse, verse 1 and verse 29 are the same. And they say this, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. And verse 29 repeats it as it closes. It says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. Praise God. So this morning, just as we're closing, hallelujah, I just want to conclude with 2 Corinthians 9, 15 from Paul that says, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. That is, it's so, there's so, such depth, such height, breadth, and length to the promises of God, to the gifts of God that are available to us. If we're in thanksgiving, we won't miss them. We won't devalue them. You know, one of the people that devalued the promise of God was Esau. You know, Esau was in the line of, uh, from Abraham, Isaac, being firstborn. He was in line uh, to the blessing that Abraham had to be a blessing in the earth, that the family that ended up going through Jacob, you know, in, could have gone through Isaac. But he devalued, he devalued. He wasn't thankful for that positioning he had as firstborn son. He had the opportunity, hallelujah, to be the progenitor of the line that was connected to the Messiah. That line, that went to Jacob because he rejected and devalued that uh, blessing to be, uh, to hold that position. And he threw it away, basically threw it away for a bowl of soup. And it says he didn't find repentance. Uh, sometimes you can go to the place where, you know, you just cut yourself off from God because you become hard-hearted. You become bitter. And uh, you become so focused into the world like a Esau was that he missed his calling. He missed his calling. And so as we just close today, let's just lift up Thanksgiving and then we'll, we'll close. Father, I thank you today. We want to be a people that are thankful, Lord God. We're thankful first and foremost for the blood and body of Jesus Christ as we shared communion this morning, Lord. I thank you for the power of the blood and the power in the broken body of Jesus that through the stripes that were on his back, as Joey explained to us, Lord God, there is a healing that can flow to us. I thank you, Lord God, that today that the people receive the benefits of the cross of Christ, receive the benefits of his death, his suffering, and his resurrection, that he has borne our sins, that he fully substituted himself. Just like those sacrifices, they substituted for the people's sins and the people's infirmities. And they were laid on them. Jesus took your infirmities. He took your pain. Hallelujah. He took it into his body, and he took it to its death. See, he took sin to its full completion on the judgment of God. But he took every sickness and disease to the point of death. You see, the prosperity of sin is death. And the prosperity of sickness, the success of sickness is it brings you to death. But Jesus took all those sicknesses, and with him, they died. When he died, those sicknesses died in him. What that means in the legal, spiritual sense of substitution is it has no right to be in you. You have to understand that. It has no right to be in you. So that cancer diagnosis or that uh, heart problem or that arthritis or any other thing that you have, anything that you have, it has no right to be there. That's why when you declare by his stripes, I was healed because it's finished. When Jesus put his head down and said, it is finished, the sickness was finished. The infirmities, the pain, it was finished. Sin was finished. It's a matter for us to understand that, enforce it, be thankful for it, and make declaration over yourself and your households, hallelujah, and your people that you know, hallelujah, that they would understand that and draw on the cross. It is finished. Jesus did it all. Jesus did it all. We just need to receive. I just want you to receive in this moment what Jesus did. There's something still that you need to receive before we close today. Hallelujah. There's something, there's some infirmity in your body. Hallelujah. We've had some prophetic word on, uh, on uh, the release and power of God, but there's something in somebody's body, whether you're here in presence or whether you're watching virtually, I want you to focus on that thing you have, and I want you to declare it. 
I want you to declare over that cancer, hallelujah, over that condition, over that arthritis, over that um, uh, hearing loss, what, whatever it is, there's things that you can declare that will release, hallelujah, that work of God, that anointing that God so wants to release to you because he paid such a great price that you could have it. Hallelujah. We don't want to devalue what you did, Jesus. We want to receive the full value, hallelujah, of the gift, the indescribable gifts that came with your cross, your death and resurrection. We thank you today. Just receive in the moment right now, in Jesus' name, the anointing. I just release the anointing of healing in the house right now. I release healing, Lord God, to those that are watching virtually, that they would receive in this moment. Hallelujah. They're thankful, Lord God. We enter your gates with thank. We're thankful for what you did. We say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you died for me. Thank you that you bore my sin. Thank you that you bore my sickness, my disease. Thank you that you bore cancer. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus right now, I don't care what the diagnosis is. Hallelujah. The spirit wor world rules over all that. The spirit world, hallelujah, the, the, wor the world of the kingdom of God has authority over that. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is inside you. It's a different operating system in you. There's a different system that operates in you. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is the governing law that operates in your spirit, soul, and body. And I just declare the movement, hallelujah, by faith. Just receive it now. Say yes, hallelujah. Release that to me, O oh God. Release your healing anointing. Just take hold of it like the woman did with the issue of blood. Just take hold of it. Just say, Jesus, I'm taking hold of what you did for me. I'm taking possession of what you have done. Hallelujah. You have healed me. I receive it this morning. I receive it this morning. It is mine. I take it, and I give thanks for it, and I worship you for it, Lord God, because you're a good God. Hallelujah. And your mercy does endure forever, and your grace abounds. So we give thanks this morning in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And all God's people said amen. Hallelujah. All God's people said amen.